Our third talk is by Kwan Hon, who is going to speak to us about the legal aspects around uh, open data, around big data, and around use of cloud services as well. Um, Kwan is an independent consultant. She specializes in the legal aspects of cloud computing, but she's originally a qualified solicitor of the Supreme Court of England and Wales. Um, as I say, she's going to address the key legal issues and pitfalls that government departments and charities should be aware of when considering a move to cloud computing, open data and big data. New technologies and paradigms, old laws. Quine. Thank you. Right. Um, after an introduction, I'll be talking mainly about cloud and then a bit about open data and big data. So this is me, two hats, four clouds, and three weasels. Um, I, I have got degrees in both law and computing science, but I've done a lot more law than coding. Uh, but hopefully I can bridge the gap between the two. The four clouds are, uh, I work as a consultant to the Cloud Legal Project at the Centre for Commercial Law Studies, Queen Mary University of London. I'm also working on another cloud project there, A4 Cloud. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was in the commercial work stream for G Cloud, although I haven't been officially involved in the G Cloud program since. And I'm also doing a PhD, a joint law and computer science PhD in cloud data protection. Now, the three weasels are weaselly disclaimers as a lawyer. Uh, first, this is, I'm just talking for me, uh, not for Queen Mary, not for the Center for Commercial Law Studies, not for any of the projects I'm involved with. Um, second one is, obviously, this is not legal advice. It is just general information. And the third one is, there is no time to do anything but a, a scratch the surface of a few things. Um, I'd be interested to know about you guys, because uh, I was told you're mainly IT. Is that right? Are there any lawyers here? Data protection, uh, freedom of information people? Oh, one, okay. Um, so are, are the rest of you, anybody from the business side? So are the rest of you IT then? Is that right? So I've, I've got the slight slant right, good. Okay, so with new technologies, and indeed with anything else, when you're looking at the legal risks, obviously it is a pyramid. It's not just legal risk you have to think about. There's reputational risk as well, and in the case of the public sector, possible breach of public trust, loss of public trust. Now, um, when you're talking to lawyers, there is something about communication and mindsets I want to talk about. So IT people think like this. You think in binary, ones and zeros, all or nothing, either or, clear dividing lines. But lawyers think in analog, in shades of gray. So there is quite a difference in the mindset. And when you have the lawyer's mantra of, oh, it depends, well, actually, it does depend. With lawyers, it's a question of interpretation and context and probabilities. It is very difficult to have certainty in law, unfortunately. So in terms of your skills when you're dealing with lawyers and, and legal issues, I think the main one is knowing who to ask and when and what you tell them. Now, the who, obviously we're talking about legal issues, so lawyers, but it's not just lawyers, but also IT, security, risk, etc. that you have to involve, you know, the, the experts that you have to involve when you need to. And in terms of when, it's as soon as possible. Don't involve the experts after the event, after you've done whatever it is, or, you know, one minute before something goes live. That's too late. Um, and I'm going to throw, uh, in terms of a what, uh, this is probably the most important part, is you have to explain to the legal experts and others who are not familiar with the situation exactly what it is that you're trying to do and how it all works, because that way they can advise you properly. Um, there's a how, feed your lawyers lots of money and that will help. Um, so, cloud, okay, right. I often get this from IT people, you know, they're worried about the internet and laws, and of course, there are so many countries in the world, and it's kind of a land grab, they're all trying to regulate the internet. So, you know, what do you do? I mean, it's not just one law you might have to worry about, it's lots of countries' laws. And obviously, this is a typical reaction, but what you can think about is you don't have to worry about it, let your lawyer worry about it, your nice friendly lawyer and the insurance policy worry about it. So, what do you, how do you brief your lawyers when you're talking about cloud computing? Well, you have to tell them what is cloud. A lot of lawyers, well, some lawyers anyway, probably still want to, to use a quill pen, okay? So you have to tell lawyers what cloud computing is about. And just to recap, 
It's the use of IT resources over a network, typically the internet. When that resource is infrastructure, like servers and storage, then it's infrastructure as a service, Amazon. Uh, when it's a software application, like email, then it's software as a service. And when it's a platform for hosting and developing applications, then it's a platform as a service. Now, a key feature about cloud that's very, very relevant to the legal issues is the possible layering of services. And the classic example is Dropbox. Dropbox is software as a service, storage as a service, but it uses Amazon. It's layered on top of Amazon's infrastructure as a service. And this layering of sub-providers and subcontractors uh, does affect the situation. Um, I've done a couple of articles on basics about cloud computing and the key differences between cloud and traditional outsourcing. I've put the links there, uh, which you can pass on to your lawyers if you want to. So the other thing that you need to tell your lawyers about is what do you want to use cloud computing for? You can't just say, oh, we just want the service. Uh, we, you know, we haven't quite, uh, we're not going to tell you, or we haven't quite decided yet. But you, you must do that. And that presupposes that you've done a requirements analysis and you know what your risk tolerance is. So you have to tell your lawyers about what your requirements are and your risk tolerance. Now, there's tons of legal issues with cloud. I mean, intellectual property, competition, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, there's no time to go to all of those, uh, but the cloud legal project uh, that I'm a consultant to, we have lots of papers on lots of these issues on there, so you can download them, and there's a book that's coming out in the autumn. But one major issue is that the contract can deal with a lot of these elements. So the checks you do before you enter into a cloud contract and what is in the cloud contract, that's going to be pretty important. And of course, for the public sector, you've got government policy to worry about as well, but you do have the lovely cloud store that's going to help make life easier for you. I want to talk about data location because that's quite important. I mean, I'm, doing, I'm working on data location for my PhD, but obviously it's very, very relevant to cloud. And particularly for the public sector, you've got the ICT offshoring guidance that came out a couple of years ago. This says you do not have to keep data in the UK. There is no requirement to keep data in the UK unless there's a national security element or there's some other legal requirement, uh, typically data protection laws. Now, on data protection laws, there has been cloud guidance released by EU data protection regulators collectively in the form of the Article 29 Working Party and also by the UK Information Commissioner. But I did want to say that, again, this is another sort of mindset thing. Law and IT, when you say data protection, you mean different things. So that's my kind of solar flare Venn diagram that shows the differences. But when lawyers say data protection, they mean data protection law. When IT people say data protection, it's narrower in some ways and broader in other ways. So you could be talking like this. You use the same words to mean different things, and that's an important point to bear in mind. Now, data protection laws, they relate to personal data as defined. So if it's kind of, it's binary in some ways and shades of gray in others. It's binary in that if something is personal data, then all the data protection laws apply to it. If it's not personal data, if it's anonymous data, none of them do. But where the shades of gray comes in is deciding is something personal data or isn't it? Now, the data export restriction under the Data Protection Directive bans the transfer of personal data outside the European economic area. Unless there's some exception or so-called adequate protection or adequate safeguards. But there are problems with these. So, in practice, the safest thing to do is keep personal data in the EEA. That, that is the easiest solution. But it has to be the European economic area not Europe. Some cloud providers say Europe, but that's not good enough because they're not the same thing. And I've done this Venn diagram that shows the difference. <laughs> I like Venn diagrams. So um, another thing to bear in mind is transfer. You can't transfer personal data outside the EEA. Now, this means not just the physical location of storage equipment or servers, edge locations and caches, it's also the location of people because somebody who's outside the EEA who has remote access to personal data in the EEA, that would be a transfer to them. So basically, the data protection regulators say you must, before you use cloud, you must find out all possible data locations. 
and you must find out all possible contractor, subcontractors as well, so the Amazon in the Dropbox case, or uh, if you're using something like SkyDocs, then it, it might be, um, I, I think it's uh, uh, um, Haru uh, and, or Heroku as well. You know, if they're multi-layered, then you have to know all those as well. And one difficult thing is if you follow this, and the other recommendations by the regulators, particularly about passing liability down the chain, actually, I think you can't use public cloud for personal data because those requirements are so strict. One of the problems is that current laws are based on traditional outsourcing. So if you liken processing personal data to cooking food, because I like food, then you have, you know, the traditional laws assume that you cook food yourself or you hire caterers to cook it for you according to your instructions. But the problem is, in cloud, it's more like renting a kitchen or getting takeout or ready meals that you cook yourself, self-service. So it's very difficult to apply laws for regulating the use of caterers to renting kitchens. One of the issues is you can have the guaranteed security and liability that the regulators want. I mean, it should be possible, but of course it's going to cost money, and that's at odds with the model of cheap or free public cloud. So I think that whoever controls the whole supply chain and can pr provide all these guarantees, like the big players who can go all the way to data center and equipment level, uh, they, they might be the likely winners when it comes to personal data. Now, some people might say, oh, well, you know, th th this is completely unworkable, forget about it, we're just going to ignore it. And it is true that, at the moment, millions of emails with personal data are probably sent outside the EEA every day in complete breach uh, of this restriction. But under the draft data protection regulation, which is going through European Parliament and Council at the moment, you could be fined up to 2% of annual global turnover if you breach the restriction. So... Nobody doubts that the EU have got very good intentions when it comes to the reforms on data protection law, but the road that that's heading for cloud may not be the most auspicious. Now, contracts, I've said contracts are extremely important. And obviously, there's three aspects to, cl to cloud contracts. You've got what you do, the checks you do before you enter into the contract, what are the terms of the contract, and then what you do after the monitoring and checks you do then. Um, we have an article on negotiated cloud contracts that was based on uh, confidential anonymous interviews with lots of cloud market players, so cloud providers, users, intermediaries, uh, integrators, law firms, etc., and, and some freedom of information requests. And there's a Forbes, a shorter Forbes report of that, uh, if you're interested. But that provides insight into how people have managed to negotiate cloud contracts, what they've managed to get, what they haven't managed to get. Because the usual starting point is it's a cloud provider standard term. So here's our terms, you've got to click and accept. And obviously, they might be weighted in favor of the provider and not necessarily appropriate to the customer, especially in regulated industries or uh, government. So the question about whether you can negotiate the cloud provider's contract, well, that depends on the customer and the deal size. If you're a big enough customer, if it's worth, you know, worth enough money to them, then they will do it. Even the biggest ones are willing to do it if you're big enough. And this typically means governments and banks. But indeed, governments and banks can go even further and say to some cloud providers, these are, these are our standard terms. We want to enter into this cloud contract with you on these terms, our terms, not yours. And then that has the opposite problem because a lot of these terms are based on traditional outsourcing. So they don't really work in cloud. They, they're not really appropriate. There's another uh, important contract issue which I think might have affected more of you than you might know, um, which is to do with internal processes. Because it is so easy to sign up for cloud, you know, you just click and accept maybe a credit card number. A lot of organizations have found that their people have been signing up for cloud services, putting internal data that, like Dropbox or whatever, and nobody knows about it until they do a review. So this is a problem for a lot of organizations. They don't realize that they're using cloud or their employees are and putting confidential data up there. So about the due diligence you do before the contract, well, if it's personal data, as I've mentioned before, um, rather like name, rank, and serial number, you get names of sub-providers, locations of data, and security of the provider. 
uh, as a practical matter, a lot of people are concerned about lock-in, being stuck with the provider, not being able to get out. And obviously, it is very sensible to test the, whether you can export data before you're actually fully committed. But of course, don't use real data, especially personal data, test with fake data. Now, on the security side, some customers have been able to get the provider to agree to let them do pen testing, find out about what the certifications are, and possibly even look at some of the documentation behind that. You also have to think about backups. Are you going to pay the provider to do backup for you? Because in you, some cases, you have to charge extra. They'll charge you extra for that. Or will you do your own backups internally or to another cloud? But you have to think about that. And after the contract, if you have audit rights and so on, you might have to actually exercise those rights and carry out those audits. Uh, I would mention the EU security uh, agency, ANISA, because they've got a lot of papers out there on cloud and risk assessment, but you do have to hunt around a bit because they're not all in the same place. They're kind of scattered around their site. So the terms of the contract themselves, for personal data, a controller of personal data who wants to use cloud computing has to choose a provider that provides sufficient guarantees effectively on security. And the contract has to contain certain terms about the provider following instructions and, and taking security measures. More generally, if you're not talking about personal data but just other data as well, uh, there has been a big issue about provider liability because a lot of providers refuse to have any liability whatsoever, and a lot of customers do want liability. So in many ways, this is a pricing issue. The more you're willing to pay, the more the provider, uh, more willing the provider will be to accept liability. Uh, Lock-in I've already discussed, you know, looking at what the term is, uh, in what circumstances can you terminate, can they terminate, uh, what happens on exit, what is the data format, can you get the data back, how long do you have to get the data back, will they delete it, etc. And security, I've already mentioned, so a lot of providers reserve the rights to disclose their data, uh, your data, I should say, to authorities on request or at least on legal uh, being served in order. And uh, audit rights uh, are another contentious aspect. A lot of providers have the right to change their terms unilaterally. They just change the terms and they tell you or you're supposed to check and, and find out about it. Um, at least in G Cloud, they do freeze the terms at the date that the pro uh, provider's accepted onto the G Cloud program. So just a bit about G Cloud. Um, you cannot carry out a mini competition. You do a search. You have to base it on price or most economically advantageous tender. No mini competition, no negotiation with a provider, although there is some scope to fill in some of the blanks. Now, the G Cloud uh, site has got lots of information, um, they're very helpful on Twitter, and they are having uh, so-called buy camp events for public sector buyers. There's one tomorrow, and there's one on 7 June, you, and all over the country, so you can just sign up and go there. Um, but one thing to bear in mind is that the G Cloud, uh, G123 so far, they take what's called the overlay approach, where you contract on the supplier's terms, but you have an overlay of particular terms that the G Cloud program has specified, which override it in case of conflict. So the issue is if there is no conflict, if there's an area that's covered by the supplier's terms but not covered in the G Cloud document, then the supplier's terms are going to win out and they will apply. And in fact, that's why they changed it um, in the first G1. They had to change it during the process because of liability wasn't covered. So you do need to get your own advice on the specific situation, on the specific terms in question. Um, and I've done a paper on G Cloud, which is also available online. It's on the first iteration, but a lot of it's still relevant. Now, open data, I'm not going to say much about because Jenny already has. Uh, she's already mentioned the Protection of Freedoms Act, uh, which will require data sets to be produced in electronic uh, reusable form and under an open license. But I would mention is that uh, there might be fees that you can charge for reuse, but we don't know the details yet as to exactly what fees you can charge and when. It's supposed to come in this month, next month, but again, is that June? Have you heard anything further? So we don't know when, but it's going to be pretty soon. There is a draft code of practice that's out for consultation, and the Information Commissioner is going to be uh, changing their publication scheme and providing guidance. But the, I suppose the key message is you have to think about now, think about what data sets have you got which might be asked for, uh, how are you going to handle requests, and start thinking now because there's not much time. 
Um, another important point about open data is the tension between open data and personal data. Uh, as I mentioned before, anonymous data, the, the data protection laws do not apply. Personal data, it does. So you're, if you are, are going to be releasing anything which might be personal data, you've got to make sure it's anonymized. Now, it is tricky. Uh, for example, uh, Professor Sweeney in the US has shown that you can identify maybe 80, 90% of the US population just from date of birth, gender, and zip code. That's enough to, to uniquely identify that many people. And she recently uh, re-identified people on a genome project, a, a DNA project. So, you know, this is, it, it can be very difficult to do, and it is a big issue. For example, last weekend, the Sunday Times revealed that everything everywhere was supposedly selling data to a research outfit, which was supposedly selling it to the police and saying, you know, we can give you information about you know, individual people's movements and so on. I, I don't know whether it's that granular and, you know, there's a, they said they said this, that, so we don't know exactly what's behind it, but obviously it is a big issue. Now, um, the Information Commissioner have produced a code of practice on my Anonymization is like phenomenon, anonymization. Uh, but um, I should say I, I did comment on some various drafts before it came out. Uh, but it is a useful document to look at. Um, and obviously, a limited controlled release is not going to be the same as making information fully public. So you have to think about all that. Now, um, the UK Anonymization Network has been set up and funded by the Information Commissioner for two years. Um, and they have anonymization clinics, and they're trying to develop best practices for anonymization. So the next one's on 28th of June, and you can sign up. Shakespeare Review, again, which Jenny has mentioned. Uh, I'm not going to say much about that, except that I I'm going to just look at the personal data element. He's saying, yes, following best practices is going to be should be enough. As long as we prosecute people who misuse data, we should have increased penalties imprisonment as well. I'm, I'm kind of a bit pessimistic about this because uh, under the data protection legislation, there is the power to send people to jail for unlawfully obtaining personal data, but the government f has refused to bring it in. And you know, Leveson, lots of parliamentary committees and so on, and now Shakespeare are saying, look, make it, make it the threat of jail time, not just the fine. But the government still hasn't done that I don't know whether they're ever going to do it, but you know that's what we really need, I think. We need to have the threat of prison. So big data, again, I'm not going to say a huge amount about, um, except that it's, you've still got data protection compliance issues, anonymization. Um, as Ian has mentioned, in some ways, maybe too much data is not necessarily a good thing because it's too much to manage. But there are also other issues like intellectual property, but uh, it's early days for that yet. So really, um, in summary, Current laws are based on outdated assumptions. They may not be appropriate to new paradigms, but they're still the law. So until they're properly updated, really, the sensible strategy is what I call four R's and four E's. You know, evaluate your requirements for your real life use, review and understand the technologies and the models that you are going to use, make a risk assessment, not just IT, but legal, etc., for your particular use case. Um, and then the four E's, you get expert advice, again, not just legal, but IT, the risk, security, etc., based on your exact intended use, explain the technology and model properly to them so they know how to advise you, and do that early, not at the last minute or after. Thank you very much.